So today, with the new film Dunkirk having just come out in the cinema, I thought it would be the perfect chance to tell the story of how that situation really came to be because it's quite an unbelievable story. The developers of War Thunder, the game that I'm playing here, they've sponsored this video kindly, but it seems that I just missed out on an in-game Dunkirk event that was running over the weekend that coincided with that new film. Big shame, but that's my fault. I should have been paying a little bit more attention. Now, if you want to give War Thunder a go, there's a link at the top of the description. Go and click that. You can sign yourself up, and through that link, you can claim either an M2A2 light tank or an F2A1 Buffalo biplane. And you get three days of premium account time, so now's not a bad time to sign up. But without further ado, let's get into the story of Dunkirk. The lead up to the events on the beaches at Dunkirk can be traced back to around April 1940. The Germans, who'd been silent pretty much since their invasion of Poland in 1939, that started World War II, they sprung a surprise attack against the Allies in Northern Europe. They'd been steadily gaining ground since April. They invaded Denmark, Norway, Belgium and the Netherlands. They fell extremely quickly because the Allies weren't prepared. And on the 10th of May, the Germans invaded France. Now, this invasion came from a different location. The French thought they'd come through the Maginot Line, and that sat on the French-German border. But instead, Germany decided to go through the Ardennes region of Belgium. They called this move the Sickle Cut. The Allies didn't expect it, and of course, it was hugely successful. The invasion of Belgium was almost secured, and Hitler continued to push his forces closer and closer to the English Channel. The Germans didn't relent, and it soon became very clear to the British command back home that there was a serious threat to the lives of just hundreds of thousands of Allied soldiers in northern France. It was essentially a backs-against-the-wall situation, and the Germans had Europe by the throat. Now, considering the Germans had such a commanding position here, their next move was quite surprising. On May the 24th, Adolf Hitler signed an order to halt the German ground forces from proceeding any further. Yeah, does seem a little bit weird. They were essentially going to push all of the Allies out of Europe back to Britain, leaving Britain the only place that Germany really needed to capture, and they decided to stop for a little bit. Yeah, you can imagine how relieved the Allies must have been at getting a little bit of breathing room at this point, but they also knew that in stopping, the Germans would eventually start back up again. Now, the reasons this order was signed off by the Führer are disputed by several different sources. Some people say it was for one reason, other people say it was for another, but I don't think we're ever going to truly know the one surefire reason why Hitler decided to do this. Some people say that he was a soldier of the Great War, World War I, 20 years earlier, and he knew the issues that could arise from his army being tired. At the moment, at this point, the Germans have been fighting for almost two weeks non-stop, and it's reason that this is why he halted the ground attack. Also, because they'd almost walked through Western Europe without much of a fight from the Allies at this point, they'd left their supplies well behind. They needed to catch up to keep them stocked with food, ammunition, and other health supplies. Another source says that the head of the Luftwaffe at the time, Hermann Göring, he had Hitler's ear and he assured him that by aerial attacks alone, the Allied forces could be finished off at Dunkirk. And another says that strategically, the halt was put in place to allow a slower approach over bad ground. The area surrounding Dunkirk and the port were extremely boggy, which gave the Allies some hope that the Germans' heavy tanks wouldn't be able to inflict too much damage. It seems the Germans knew this too because they set about building bridges over some of the canals. What this halt order actually represented, looking back at it now, was a colossal mistake. Hitler must have known he could have finished off the Allied defence in mainland Europe, he could have killed off or captured hundreds of thousands of prisoners, depleting armies of the Allies, but his decision was to just stop. And this gave the Allies much needed time. Now, it was very quickly realised by the Allies that the only way they were going to survive this thing was to retreat even further, back to Britain and evacuation by sea. 
The issue arose, however, of the extremely shallow waters around the coast of France near Dunkirk. They are extremely shallow and only very small boats could get to the shoreline. They wouldn't allow for the British fleet to get close enough and let soldiers on board. You couldn't get a destroyer within five feet of the sand. The solution to this was concocted in a secret bunker under the cliffs of Dover in the British Isles. It was called Operation Dynamo and it was the plan that saved the British Army and hundreds of thousands of Allied soldiers. On May 26th, Winston Churchill, British Prime Minister, he activated Operation Dynamo. Basically, the British Navy started going around Britain and requisitioning any boats they could find, ordering their owners to give them up, or letting the owners sail them across the English Channel, don't forget, that's a war zone right now, and rescue the stranded soldiers on Dunkirk Beach. As I mentioned, the extremely shallow waters meant the British fleet couldn't get close enough, so these smaller boats would be able to get right up onto the beaches and let the soldiers get straight in. Now, the British command in Dunkirk, they set about organising the soldiers into larger groups on the beaches and filling the two jetties that stuck out into the British Channel. These jetties would be used for smaller ships to moor up against as they were filled with soldiers and about 800 boats in total were taken by the Navy or they were sailed across the channel by their owners to collect soldiers. They were now suffering at the hands of the German Luftwaffe. Hermann Göring had essentially been given free reign by Hitler to finish off the Allies at Dunkirk through a series of bombing runs and fighter attacks. The Allies were the most sitting of sitting ducks you could have possibly gotten in 1940. They were all doing what they could to hold their positions with the new defences being built in Dunkirk. They were now repulsing the German ground attack because that had resumed because Hitler realised that the Allies were starting to escape and mainly French soldiers were doing all that defending. The boggy ground did indeed slow the German advance and the French resisted for about six days in total. Now whilst those French soldiers were defending the town of Dunkirk, the British command were working to get as many of their own soldiers off the beach as they could. The official evacuation target was 45,000 men. That's just a little bit over 10% of the total men on the beach. The British were prepared to lose a lot of lives to the Germans and potentially hundreds of thousands of prisoners of war as well. And that's not to mention the equipment losses that the British had. Tanks, supplies, weapons, ammunition and even more, they were just all left in Dunkirk because firstly, the vehicles, they couldn't be transported back very quickly and the weaponry and supplies because, well, they take up valuable space in the boats that could be taken by another soldier. And the British command had worked really hard to acquire as many boats as they possibly could. Unofficially, it was known to the British command that of course the next place the Germans would try to capture were the British Isles and protecting those with whatever they had was extremely important. So getting the soldiers home as opposed to the equipment was preferred. Those 800 boats, which were mostly civilian and rather small obviously, they didn't have an easy task making it to Dunkirk and then back again. The German coastal defences to the west of Dunkirk near Calais and to the east when the Belgians surrendered a couple of days into Operation Dynamo, that meant that travelling too close to the perimeter of where the Allied soldiers were protecting, those boats would be under constant bombardment from German shore batteries. German U-boats were prowling the channel under the water and of course, all of those boats had to avoid the mines that had been laid by the Germans as well. It would take roughly six hours for a round trip for some of these boats. Two hours to come across, two hours to fill it up, turn round and get going the other way and then two hours to cross all the way back again. Some of them would take longer depending on which route they took back to Britain and whether they met any complications like saving stranded soldiers in the middle of the channel whose boats had been hit by the Luftwaffe that were strafing them. These boats were essentially just little pleasure cruisers, tiny little wooden hulls and they were being used in a war zone to save lives so that the soldiers could fight another day. It just boggles the mind of what some people were risking here. What baffles me the most though about the story of Dunkirk is 
that it doesn't strike me as one of total chaos and fear. There are numerous reports of boats arriving to collect stranded soldiers and of course, these people were expecting just mass panic, bodies everywhere and just a huge rush from the soldiers still alive to try and get away from these beaches but it was mostly calm and fairly organised. The soldiers were lining up on the moles that jutted out into the sea or they were even just sitting in the sea themselves up to their shoulders in water all in line just waiting for a boat to come along and take them to safety. And that's when you consider that they'd had to surrender their weapons as well because they couldn't take them back on these smaller boats. They had no way to defend themselves if the Luftwaffe decided to drop a bomb on the beach. That kind of bravery in that situation is just incredible. It is so hard to try and feel what they must have been feeling. Almost helpless, like I said, sitting ducks in the water just waiting to be saved. Over the course of nine days, the British, thanks to a brief pause in the German attack and the French defending Dunkirk, they managed to evacuate roughly 340,000 soldiers from the beaches of Dunkirk. Roughly 65,000 soldiers died at the hands of German attacks whilst they were waiting to be rescued and about 40,000 French soldiers who'd been guarding Dunkirk while this whole operation went on behind them, they were forced to surrender when the Germans finally took the town. And while this whole operation was considered a success and so many Allied soldiers were taken away to safety, it wasn't celebrated as a success by Winston Churchill. In his speech to the House of Commons on June the 4th, the day Operation Dynamo ended, he reminded the British people that we must be very careful not to assign this deliverance the attributes of a victory. Wars are not won by evacuations. So that's the story of Dunkirk and if you haven't watched the film yet, you should 100% go and watch it. My stepdad wants to go and watch it now and I'm going to go and see it with him again. It was that good of a film, even though it's about a terrible disaster and a huge success story at the same time, it is just filmed beautifully. Thank you to the developers of War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to go and sign up for an account, click the link at the top of the description, claim a free vehicle and some premium account time. Free stuff. Who doesn't love that? And thanks to you guys for watching the video as well. But until next time, my name is Westy, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.